Agile software development is how most organizations develop software these days. That wasn't always the case. If you'd asked any large organization how they developed software 20 years ago, they'd have described complex project plans with lengthy, lengthy analysis and design phases up front, followed by testing after the code was finished. Waterfall. With confidence that, that that was the correct answer to the question and the best approach, Agile has changed all of that. If you ask those same organizations now, they'd answer Agile. But is this really true? Everyone claims to be working in an agile way these days, but my experience is that if you look beyond the rituals, it looks an awful lot like waterfall. So, is agile development a big step forward, or as often depicted, just another failed approach? What does agile really mean without the process religion? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and if you enjoy the video, hit like as well at the end. In this episode, we will explore what I think Agile really means, why I think it's an important step forwards, but not quite the destination. There are lots of videos that describe Agile practices, but I think they tend to often miss the point. I want to talk about why Agile matters. In, it matters because it's iterative and based on feedback, allowing teams to learn. It's unbounded, experimental, and built on the idea of adapting to change. From the beginnings of computing, there have always been small teams innovating, and big, more corporate approaches to development too. Here is a fantastic document from the CEO of IBM in 1963 asking how a tiny insignificant startup called Cray could beat the mighty vast IBM to create the world's best supercomputer. The document contains these words. Last week, CDC had a press conference during which they officially announced their 6600 system. I understand that in, labor in the laboratory developing this system, there are only 34 people, including the janitor. Of these, 14 are engineers and four are programmers. Contrasting this modest effort with our own vast development activities, I fail to understand why we have lost our industry leadership. The response from Seymour Cray was perfect. It seems like Mr. Watson has answered his own question. Small teams have always been more effective than large teams uh, in all kinds of innovation, but certainly in software development. But we still tried to scale them up. If you'd like to learn more about how to apply the ideas in this video, I have a series of training courses that I think will help. There's a link in the description down below. This week we're also running a competition on Twitter where you can win one of my training courses, so do take a look. Through the 1980s and 90s, the computer revolution really began to take off, and everyone wanted to build software. So the industry scaled up really fast, and the software productivity problem that people had been discussing for decades really started to bite. So people applied the techniques that they'd used in other industries. There was one huge problem with this. They were trying to solve a problem that we didn't have. Most of human experience of production is in making physical things. Making a physical thing involves creativity, innovation and design, sure, but the really hard part of that problem is scaling up to produce it at scale, with, at a price, with you know, quality and so on. Here is a cup. Uh, it's a design that's been around for decades, maybe centuries, mugs like this, with similar kind of shape. There's not an awful lot of innovation in this design, and that's a good thing if you want to mass produce it. So you might kind of worry about the pictures that are on it and so on, but the really hard part of, the, the, of this cup is how do you mass produce it? How do you get all the materials to the right place at the right team, time? How do you create the machinery that's going to generate millions of these cups for a low price? That is a problem that we in software never have because we can just clone the product of our work, the sequence of bytes that represents our system at the push of a button. 
We've become so accomplished at producing physical things that we tend to think of ideas like production lines as natural and obvious. So that was how most organizations tried to improve the productivity of software, by creating software production lines, which is really what waterfall development is. Interestingly, chemical engineers have a taxonomy for process control. Uh, uh, here is a description of one such process control approach. The defined process control model requires that every piece of work be completely understood. Given a well-defined set of inputs, the same outputs are generated every time. A defined process can be started and allowed to run until completion with the same results every time. Waterfall is a defined process control approach. Sadly, software development is not a defined process. That's not really how software development works. The waterfall era was a time of massive growth in software produ production, but also quite a lot of expensive software failures. During this time, I mostly worked as part of a small, fairly innovative teams, uh, but I did work on several waterfall projects, often in the capacity of coming in and rescuing them. Uh, of course, there were waterfall projects that succeeded. My impression, though, is that the model is such a terrible fit for software development uh, that the only way in which these products, e sorry, these projects ever succeeded was down to a few very good people who somehow bypassed the process so that they could actually create some software. The trouble is, in software, we don't have a production problem, ever. Unless we are dumb, production is, for us, so low cost that, in practice, it's free. Ours is a problem of learning and discovery. The innovation and design bit at the start of the process is the part that we need to focus on. There are other process control models that come from the chemical engineers that talk about those sorts of processes. Here's one. The empirical model of process control provides and exercises control through frequent inspection and adaption for processes that are imperfectly defined and generate unpredictable and unrepeatable outputs. That sounds quite a lot closer to software development to me. We solve problems that are imperfectly understood and we generate unpredictable and unrepeatable results in terms of the designs of the, that we come up with to solve those problems. If ours is a problem of discovery and learning, then we should optimize to be expert at discovery and learning. Humanity's best approach for discovery and learning is science. Agile starts from the assumption that we don't know the answer. Waterfall started from the assumption that we have to know the answer before we can begin. This is an enormous difference. It means that ultimately, Waterfall is much more limited in the scale and complexity of the systems that it can successfully build. Forgive me for nerding out for a moment, but I recently read, a couple of years ago actually, a, a book on the philosophy of physics. It was called The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, and it's a mind-expanding, difficult book. It's, it's difficult because you have to keep stopping reading it and think about it because it's so full and dense with ideas. In it, Deutsch describes how knowledge progresses. And it moves from limited ways of thinking to unbounded, infinite ways of thinking. One description of this idea that really resonated with me is the idea of alphabets. Before alpha alphabets, there were pictographs, and this was the first form of writing, and they've been around for a very long time. In pictographic writing, words are represented by little pictures that capture the concept that they're trying to convey. But this form of writing is not really scalable. If you want to write a word that you've never seen written, you can make up a picture, but now you've got to go and show that picture and explain why that represents the concept to everybody that's going to read it. Uh, if you see a picture that you've never seen before in the writing, how do you know what the word is trying to, what word it's trying to convey? You might guess, but you don't know. The enormous step to infinity uh, that writing took was the step to alphabets. These are a much more abstract idea. Instead of capturing a word with a picture, the concept, 
which seems like a really good idea and fairly obvious, what we do instead is that we try and capture the sounds that we speak when we say that word with letters. We can then represent any stream of sounds in written form, even just noises. Now you can read a word that you've never heard before. You may have to look up what it means, but you can read the word. Um, but you'll have a rough approximation or two of how it sounds based on the spelling of the word. Also, you can write any word that you can say or think, even if you've just made it up. You can spell a word wrong, but people will be able to recreate the sounds. This is unbounded, and so now, with just a few letters, 26 in English, uh, you could read and write any word. I think that taking an agile approach represents a similar transition, a step to infinity. Uh, if we need to establish a plan at the start of our work, a plan that is accurate enough to predict what we have to do over weeks, months or even years, that puts a limit to how complex the plan can be. The bigger, more complex the system, the more likely something will go wrong with our plan. We could choose to plan in less detail. Now there are more gaps for mistakes. Or we could up the level of detail, minimise the plan risk, and so limit how complex our system can be. But those are our choices. To create an unbounded system, we would need omniscient foresight. The idea that you can start out by learning all that you need to know to do a perfect job is an illusion. Because, as well as the fact that things are changing all of the time, there's a limit to our capacity to plan and hold those plans in our heads. Agile starts from what I think of as a much more rational stance. We don't know the answers yet, but we will find out as we go. Let's work iteratively to learn a little bit before moving on. Let's work so that we can change our minds about anything if we find out that it was a mistake. Let's not plan ahead in detail. Let's not try to predict an unknowable future. One of the cornerstones of this approach, the way that we find out if our ideas are good or bad, is inspect and adapt. We try something. If it works, great, let's carry on and see if it still works later as well. If it doesn't work, then we can decide what to do. Maybe we should just drop that idea, maybe it's a bad idea, or maybe our experiment wasn't good enough and we should refine the experiment and try again so that we can learn more. This is empirical discovery in practice. This is experimental. This is really the same idea that started science off a few hundred years ago. Agile is based on a series of informal experiments, empirical learning that allow us to test our ideas and, importantly, reject the bad ones. I am a long-time supporter and practitioner of Agile thinking. This is not about stand-ups or continuous integration or scrum masters or test-driven development. These are tools that should help us in our quest to inspect and adapt. No more than that. These are all good tools. All of them, though, can be and regularly are misused. If you apply these or any other agile ideas but don't use them to inspect and adapt frequently, you aren't being agile. Agile is a philosophy of learning and discovery. Agile thinking is much more important and has much wider applicability than only software. My wife once applied an agile approach to collecting rents in a housing association and dramatically improved the efficiency of that process as a result. It works, and it works for some good reasons because science works. In software, agile was a vital step forwards, a step towards infinity in Deutsch's terms. So I have little time for people that talk about post-agile ideas. However, I do think there are some steps beyond Agile thinking that can add even more value beyond it. My take is that the reason that Agile was so successful is because it's an informal take on the fundamental philosophy of science. Agile was a reaction to the horrors of waterfall. I think that the next step forward must build on Agile thinking.
but should be a little bit more proscriptive perhaps. All ideas aren't created equal. Some ideas are just wrong. So how do we eliminate the bad ideas? I think that we can do more to help development teams to make better choices. I think that we can do that by learning and applying some more ideas and lessons from science and developing a practical discipline for the application of those, that scientific reasoning to software. In other fields, we would call that engineering. Thank you very much for watching.